Fireside Tales for Wolfgang. Originally broadcast on GWC Productions' YouTube channel, Caps Media Television Channel 6 in Ventura on KPPQ LP Ventura at 104.1 FM and on the KPPQ Podcast Network. Episodes can also be viewed on Pasadena Media either on Spectrum Charter Channel 32 or on AT&T Uverse Channel 99. Fireside Tales for Wolfgang. Greetings and salutations. I'm Hunter Ackerman, here to read some classic literature for you. All right, all right, all right. So, uh, tonight, we have the treat of the last installment of Unstable Geniuses, written by my dad, Neil Ackerman. And, uh, yes, the conflict, climax, and resolution all coming at you tonight. <clears throat> but uh, to begin with, we're going to open with some poetry by a man named John Gould Fletcher. Now, he was born in 1886, and he passed away in 1950. John Gould Fletcher was an imagist poet. Uh, he was also uh, a literary author and an authority on modern painting. Now, when we say modern painting, of course, um, the, the term still applies uh, in anything that is not further back several hundred years. So John Gould Fletcher lived in the same era that we now describe as modern painting. While Fletcher lived in England, he associated with Emily Lowell, Ezra Pound, and other Imagist poets who, com uh, who commended him for the individ individuality of rhythm in his poems. Uh, in 1939, he won the Pulitzer Prize for poetry. The following poems are all from the book published in 1916 called Some Imagist Poets, an Annual Anthology. This poem is called The Windmills by John Gould Fletcher. The windmills like great sunflowers of steel lift themselves proudly over the straggling houses and at their feet the deep blue-green alfalfa cuts the desert like the stroke of a sword. Yellow melon flowers crawl beneath the withered peach trees. A date palm throws its heavy fronds of steel against the scoured metallic sky. The houses, double-roofed for coolness, cower amid the manzanita scrub. A man with jingling spurs walks heavily out of a vine-bowered doorway, mounts his pony, rides away. The windmills stare at the sun. The yellow earth cracks and blisters. Everything is still. In the afternoon, the wind takes dry waves of heat and tosses them, mingled up with dust, up and down the streets against the belfry with its green bells. And after sunset, when the sky becomes a green and orange fan, the windmills like great sunflowers on dried stalks, stare hard at the sun they cannot follow. Turning, turning, forever turning in the chill night wind that sweeps over the valley with the shriek and the clank of the pumps groaning beneath them and the choking gurgle of tepid water. This poem is called Clouds Across the Canyon by John Gould 
Fletcher. Shadows of clouds march across the canyon. Shadows of blue hands passing over a curtain of flame. Clutching, staggering, upstriking, darting in blue-black fury to where pinnacles, green and orange, await. The winds are battling and striving to break them. Thin lightnings spit and flicker. The peaks seem a dance of scarlet demons flitting amid the shadows. Gray rain curtains wave afar off. Wisps of vapor curl and vanish. The sun throws soft shafts of golden light over rose buttressed palisades. Now, the clouds are a lazy procession. Blue balloons bobbing solemnly over black dappled walls where rise sharp fretted golden roofed cathedrals exultantly and split the sky with light. Ooh, that sounds like the sky at Burning Man. That really does. Now the clouds are a lazy procession, blue balloons bobbing solemnly over black dappled walls where rise sharp, where rise sharp fretted golden roofed cathedrals exultantly and split the sky with light. That's a phrase. This poem is called In the Theater by John Gould Fletcher. Darkness in the theater. Darkness and a multitude assembled in the darkness. These who every day perform the unique tragicomedy of birth and death now press upon each other, directing the irresistible weight of their thoughts to the stage. A great broad shaft of calcium light cleaves like the stroke of a sword the darkness, and at the end of it, a tiny spot, which is the red nose of a comedian, marks the goal of the spotlight and the eyes which people the darkness. This poem is Ships in the Harbor by John Gould Fletcher. Like a flock of great blue cranes resting upon the water, the ships assemble at morning when the gray light wakes in the east. Weary, no longer flying over the hissing spindrift through the raveled, clutching sea, no longer over the tops of the waves spinning along northeastward in a great irregular wedge before the trade wind far from land, but drowsy, mournful, silent. Yet, under their bulged, projecting bows, runs the silver foam of the sunlight, and rebelliously they shake out their plumage of sails, wet and heavy with the rain. All right, so before we launch into the coup de grace of Unstable Geniuses, I thought I'd read a little quick summary so the quick summary of parts one through three. Our story begins when cranky Vladimir Frisbee is confronted by park ranger Chumley with a ticket for Frisbee's sinking boat. His boat, fishing, and beer are the only things Vladimir Frisbee truly loves. Later, Frisbee finds a lottery ticket worth $10 million on a murder victim. And this same dead man is also the same park ranger who gave Vladimir Frisbee the ticket. Even though he's innocent of the murder, Vladimir is a prime suspect because 
He had earlier hit this same park ranger with a boat oar for writing Frisbee a ticket. Frisbee had even threatened to kill the ranger, and there were witnesses. After Vladimir, after Vladimir is announced as the holder of the winning lottery ticket, he's invited to appear on the Reverend Jim B. Sunshine's television show. Also, an admiral from Nigeria has contacted Frisbee to assist in smuggling $15 million out of the admiral's native country. Vladimir turns the admiral down, but links him up with his nephew, Kermit Plaid, who jumps at the chance. Aware that the innocent Frisbee is the prime murder suspect, the real killer and the killer's sister, who is the murdered man's ex-wife, confront Vladimir and convince the old man to split the winnings with them. Unfortunately, they invest all their money in Damien Hyde's phony hedge fund. Of course, their money disappears along with Mr. Hyde when Hyde's scam is revealed. Investors in the defunct hedge fund are invited to a meeting chaired by lawyers who are eager to begin a class action lawsuit against Damien Hyde. When Vladimir arrives at the meeting, he's shocked to discover that Reverend Jimmy B. Sunshine, his own nephew, Kermit Plaid, and the Nigerian Admiral Nagomo are also in the audience. And this is the summary for part four to get everyone caught up for tonight. In part four, Reverend Jimmy B. Sunshine gathers people who have been ripped off by Damien Hyde, and they elect to strike out on their own to find the man who stole their money. Their aim is to recoup more than the measly 10 or 20 percent which attorney Cosmo Cockburn has promised with a successful lawsuit. Admiral Nagomo admits that he had secretly enlisted two agents, codenames Searchlight and Death Star, to assist in the hunt for Mr. Hyde. Also, the Reverend reveals that he's been involved, excuse me, that he has been invited to join a cabal, which Vladimir and friends label as the Cheney Gang. They think Dick Cheney is a part of this cabal. The cabal's mission is to track down Damien Hyde and kill him. Reverend Jimmy's gang knows you can't get money from a dead man, so they all want Damien Hyde alive, at least for now. By a strange coincidence, Lydia Bunking is known to Damien Hyde as Candy Apple, and she is Hyde's ideal of a perfect-looking woman. The Reverend learns from the Cheney gang that Damien Hyde is a furry and that there is a three-day furry convention coming up in Phoenix, Arizona. Many suspect that Damien Hyde will attend the convention dressed as a great white shark, so Vladimir Frisbee and friends all go dressed as furries to FurCon Phoenix. Their plan is to use Lydia Bun King, attired as a sexy bunny, to ensnare their nemesis and make him tell them where the money is hidden. Vladimir Frisbee spends most of his time looking for the beer wagon. Part four concludes with the Heavenly Hills Bunch discouraged because there has been no sign of the Cheney Gang and no sign of Hyde as a great white shark. Part five, the conclusion of our story, begins with day three of Furcon Phoenix as the unstable geniuses continue to hunt their quarry. Now, I hope all of you envisioned that with the uh, Star Wars yellow type, you know, going past my face. Let's go with that. To reintroduce this evening's title, Unstable Geniuses. A novella by Neil Ackerman. Copyright 2019 under the title Vladimir Frisbee's Revenge by Neil Ackerman, Smashwords Edition. 
Authors note, this book may not be used for commercial use without the permission of the author. Author's son's note, we have permission right here and now. And now, part five, chapter 22, Furcon Phoenix, day three. D. Bentley Brown was on the move, and even though a dark Toyota Camry turned every time he turned and slowed every time he slowed, Bentley was none the wiser. He was careful not to speed, knowing that he would have a hard time explaining to a cop why there was a man dressed as a shark hidden in his trunk. When he pulled into the convention center, he followed the signs marked deliveries and parked next to the loading dock. After taking his burner phone out of his pocket, he punched in a number. Okay, we're in position. Shortly afterwards, a convention center door opened, a man looked out, and when the man spotted Bentley's car, he signaled that the coast was clear. With a pair of binoculars pressed to his face, Death Star watched Bentley open his trunk and assist a wobbly great white shark out and to his feet. Damien straightened himself, then scurried to the open, open door. These Americans are a crazy bunch of f***ers. Death Star mumbled as he turned on the mic lent to him by Reverend Jimmy. Death Star to Cobra. Death Star to Cobra. Do you read? Loud and clear. The fish is in the tank. The fish is in the tank. We copy. We copy. Fish entered by a rear entrance in the southwest corner of the building. Good job, Death Star. Good job. Sexy bunny, you are up. Lion and moose, do like we planned. Stay close to her, but not too close. As an admiral in the Nigerian Navy, it was natural for Nagomo to assume command when the action became critical. Okay, everybody, this is Sexy Bunny. I see Moose. I'm going silent now. Wish me luck. With that, Lydia took off her communication gear and handed it to Harley. Earlier that morning, Kermit Frog was acting as greeter. He had his back to the outside doors, and along with a fox and a cat was singing a rendition of the Beatles' classic Yellow Submarine. They finished when he was startled by the blast of a horn. Out of my way, freaks! Was the last thing that he heard before Fox mercifully shoved him aside. Kermit's swim fins did not permit him to move fast enough on his own to avoid a collision. Someone needs to do something about that damn badger. He's a f***ing menace said Cat, while helping Kermit back up to his feet. Lion soon caught up with Moose. Orlando had not yet sighted Sexy Bunny and said so. Turning his head, Moose gave a quick nod, pointing to her location with one of his antlers. They followed Lydia around the convention hall, staying 40 feet behind her, she was having no luck finding her meal ticket and began to wonder if Death Star had gotten it wrong, when suddenly, not ten feet in front of her, a great white shark materialized. Moose saw them too. Contact, ladies and gentlemen. Contact. Damien Hyde was searching for the room when he saw her and the sighting struck him like a bolt of lightning. As he ran to greet her, he said without thinking, Candy Apple! The words came out of his mouth before it occurred to him that it was not her real name. You can call me anything you want, you gorgeous hunk of fish, she said in her bedroom voice, a voice she had mastered early in life. It was not the first time that she had been mistaken for this candy person, but she did think it strange that it occurred upon meeting Damien Hyde for the first time. 
She had Googled the name once. There were several candy apples, but the one that caught her eye was the one that featured her in the photo. She remembered the picture. It was one of many taken during a photo shoot. The Chicago BMW dealer she worked for had used it to advertise a sports car. And the ad ran for at least a year on several different Chicagoland television stations and in newspapers. Obviously, her picture was being used as a part of a scam to trick lonely men into sending money. And she considered it a crime that she wasn't getting a cut of the action. Lydia Bun King had several guns in her arsenal, and she was prepared to use them all. Her ordnance included a darling kitten face graced with pouty lips. Sexy Bunny had seen clips of Damien Hyde's congressional testimony, had watched him smirk, and had learned of his price gouging. In addition to those disgusting attributes, Moose had told her about Orlando Budd's son and the part that Hyde played in the boy's death. She despised the man, hated his face, thought him to be a hideous creature, not a great white shark at all, but a cockroach that she planned to squash. No match for Lydia Bun King, the shark was quickly under her spell and she was not likely to show him mercy. So overcome by being in the presence of his longtime dream fantasy, Great White began drooling. His brain was in free fall. He fawned, he stuttered, and vainly grasped for the right words. Sadly, no one was aware of the actual irony. The Heavenly Hills bunch was using the same person to ensnare Hyde that he had used to dupe many horny, naive American men. Most to everyone. Attention. Looks like the fish is taking the bait. Repeat. The fish is taking the bait. The plan was for Lydia to lead Hyde off to a dark corner near the rear exit. Moose and Lion were to grab him and usher him out to the loading dock where Frog would be waiting behind the wheel of the Evangelical Lutheran Beats bus. Once all were on board, they would return to Sedona to Reverend Jimmy's estate where Hyde would be held captive and be forced to tell them where their money was hidden. Sexy Bunny did as instructed. She was holding hands with Great White Shark, or Paw and Finn, as in this case, and had gotten to the southwest corner of the convention center, not far from the rear entrance. This is Frog. This is Frog. Bus is in position. I repeat, bus is in position. It bothered Kermit that there was a gray BMW motor running also in position and parked directly in front of him. All right, this is Moose. Lion and I are going in for the kill. Going in for the kill. While 30 feet away and closing on Damien Hyde and his candy apple, Moose and Lion were taken by surprise when a hammerhead shark attacked their great white. Both were wrestling on the floor when a wardrobe malfunction exposed the hammerhead's face. Holy sh**, holy Moose broadcast to the, uh, to the others. This is Cobra. This is Cobra. What's wrong, Moose? What's wrong? Moose and Lion were hurrying forward to join in the fray. It's the pit bull. It's, it's Cosmo Cockburn. He just tackled the... But Moose's transmission was interrupted by the blast of a horn directly behind them and closing fast. Both Moose and Lion were knocked to the floor where they lay dazed for several minutes. The collision with the two large furries caused Badger to be thrown from his wheelchair. The chair rolled over and came to a rest directly on top of Cosmo Cockburn. 
The helpless badger cursed and fumed as he watched the great white shark pick himself up and, with sexy bunny in tow, head for the exit. Kermit Plaid, waiting in the alley, watched shark and bunny jump into the BMW and take off like a bullet. Kermit had no choice but to follow. Chapter 23 Bun King's allegiance is called into question. The BMW sped down the street. As Kermit Plaid followed one block behind, he began to recall another time. A time Lydia Bun King proved inconstant, and he wondered how much she could be trusted. Back in Chicago, she had been assigned to entrap an embezzler. Instead, Bun King fell for the con man's lies and formed a partnership with the enemy. Plaid worried that time would repeat itself. Bun King's capricious nature might prevail, and she might once again fall for lies told by a persuasive scoundrel. Cobra? Beaver? Anybody? Can, can you hear me? Can, can you hear me? No one responded. Evidently, Frog was out of radio range. The chase ended when the BMW disappeared into an underground parking garage with a low clearance. Kermit judged that the bus could not fit. Luckily, he had his cell phone and he called his uncle Warthog. Vladimir, who had continued to keep the beer wagon company, began after one hour to consider it his exclusive domain. He had wasted a lot of beer while attempting to drink while wearing his warthog mask, so he had discarded it, preferring instead to go furry commando. He, two dogs, and a giraffe had been standing around swapping lies for the previous two hours, and he guardian of the keg, acted as bartender, pouring beers for the occasional furry. Thus employed, he answered Kermit's call after several rings. Uh, yeah, hello. Uncle Warthog, thank God you answered. Will you stop with that Warthog? Uh, yeah, sure. Look, I lost him. You hear me? I lost him. Wait. Wait, wait, wait. Lost who? Bun King and Hyde. They pulled into that garage next to the Hyatt. After that, I, I don't know where they went. Tell, just tell Cobra exactly what I just told you. The message was relayed to the Admiral, and the Admiral asked Frisbee to call his nephew back and have him return to the convention center. Searchlight and Death Star were d dispatched to the Hyatt to reconnoiter. D. Bentley Brown dropped Damien and Lydia off in the parking garage, then sped away. He had thought he had been followed, but there was no sign of the bus. Must have been my imagination, Bentley thought on the return to Jolly Roger headquarters. A tunnel connected the garage with the hotel. People stopped and gawked at the shark and the bunny as they sprinted for the elevator. During the ordeal, the source of Bun King's motivation was her potential multi-million dollar payout. That in mind, she kept up her performance while, think of, while thinking of a way to subdue the horny shark. Once inside the penthouse, Hyde left fragments of his costume scattered across the floor as he sprinted toward the master bedroom. Kermit returned to the convention center to collect the rest of the Heavenly Hills crew. Moose and Lion had to forcibly pull Warthog away from the beer wagon. Old but still scrappy, Vladimir had neither the advantage of surprise nor access to a boat oar, and therefore, the two large and fortunate furries suffered only minor bruises. Once on the bus and heading back to rediscover Shark and Bunny's trail, a trail that undoubtedly had grown cold, people were beginning to question Bun King's loyalty. Searchlight and Death Star had reported finding no sign of the two. Apparently, 
Bun King had left no clues for them to follow. Exactly. What do you know about her, Plaid? Asked Beaver. Or the costumed Jimmy B. You don't think she jumped ship and is now in league with Hyde? Asked the Admiral. She could be a whole lot richer with him than with us. Kermit did not answer any of the questions thrown at him. He realized that he actually knew very little about the woman. Where she came from, where she lived before she worked for him in Chicago. Haunted as he was by the knowledge of Bun King's past duplicity, a bead of sweat appeared on his brow. Boy, the traffic sure is heavy. Bus driver Kermit Plaid thought that would throw off his tenacious inquisitors. Chapter 24. The Welcome Phone Call. Kermit's cell phone sounded call to the post, which is the tune sounded by a bugler before the start of a horse race. Can someone answer that for me? It's not easy for me to drive and talk at the same time. In Illinois, it's against the law, so I'm also not used to doing it. Reverend Jimmy, riding shotgun, reached for the phone and put it on speaker. Guys, <clears throat> it's me, Lydia. Where, where, where are you? In the bus, two blocks from the Hyatt, said the Reverend. An audible sigh of relief went from one end of the bus to the other. Great. Here's what I want you to do. Park the bus near the hotel and come up to the penthouse. I have a surprise for you. All seven furries, still in costume, turned several heads as the Heavenly Hills bunch entered the lobby. They squeezed into the elevator and rode it to the top floor. Bun King was waiting in the hallway outside the door to the luxury suite. Okay, everyone. First, cover your eyes. Then you can come in. The government's forensic economists made no progress in tracking down the Lutheran Strategic Partners hedge fund money. How can you make $3.7 billion disappear? Lead investigator Harlow Turnstile asked a room full of frustrated accountants, mathematicians, and computer experts. No one had an answer. Finally, someone spoke. We need Damien Hyde. That's who we need. Word is, he's out of the country. Croatia is what the FBI has been saying, said an accountant. That's the chatter I've been hearing, said another. Bun King led her seven employers through the penthouse apartment. They walked through what seemed like four rooms before Lydia Bun King slowed. There were curious sounds coming from the room in front of them thrashing sounds, and the sound of someone's muffled complaints. Okay, you can look now. Lying before them on the California King was a completely naked Damien Hyde. On his back, arms and legs splayed out like Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, with the exception that each appendage was tied to a bedpost and a sock was stuffed in his mouth. All but Vladimir Frisbee laughed. Vladimir recalled a time when he was in a similar jam and so found nothing funny about Damien Hyde's current predicament. Chapter 25, The Interrogation. The penthouse was huge, but Reverend Jimmy, Admiral Nagomo, and Harley Dinkelman each booked rooms of their own. Melba Jean shared with Harley. Vladimir, Kermit, Lydia, and Orlando stayed in the penthouse. Having two baths and enough other nooks and crannies afforded each adequate privacy. An around-the-clock guard was posted on Mr. Hyde, and explicit instructions were left at the front desk that none of the hotel staff was to enter. The interrogations began immediately. Vladimir, 
still feeling after effects from beer keg duty. God in Damien's face. All right, you bastard, where's the money, mother? Then turning and indicating Melba Jean, who was still masquerading as a demure lamb, give me my money or I'll have this lady cut your dick off. Melba Jean Sunshine positively glowed. Mr. Frisbee, is it? Hyde asked with a smirk. Why don't you do something about your breath? There was present could see that Damien Hyde was going to be a tough nut to crack, with the possible exception of Melba Jean, who seemed at ease and surprisingly confident, as if she were certain that the situation could be turned in their favor. All but Melba Jean had a go at the great white shark. She did not complain. It was almost as if she were being held in reserve. Vladimir Frisbee discovered two full cases of Dom Perignon. He'd opened one of the bottles and passed it around. They celebrated what they had thus far accomplished, the capture of the most hated man in America, since it was a task that so many others failed to complete, namely the federal government, the Cheney gang, and Cosmo Cockburn, they had earned a pat on the back. After the first bottle went around, Reverend Jimmy B. Sunshine opened a second. With the bottle held high, he proposed a toast. And a special salute to you, Lydia Bun King. Without your unique talent, this would not have been possible. Hear, hear! All the furries joined in chorus, and soon the second bottle was consigned to history. Day two came and went with no results. It was late on day three, and it was Reverend Jimmy's turn to attempt to break Damien Hyde's will. The Reverend spoke of God, of life in the hereafter, of the importance of a pure spirit and a clear conscience, and finished with what he thought would be the coup de grace, a mini commercial listing the many benefits of flying Jesus. Despite his final and best effort, all he had extracted from Damien Hyde was one more of the man's infuriating smirks. Stepping back from the California King bed, the reverend heaved a deep sigh. He turned to Melba Jean and said, Okay, sis, it's time for you to turn on your charm. It was almost as if he regretted the move. Mostly, mostly, the reverend abhorred violence. A defiant Hyde said, Oh boy, what's this, another sermon? I can't wait. With an open bottle of Dom Perignon in her hand, she stood over Damien Hyde. Then, took a long pull on the bottle, belched, and asked in a cold, heartless voice that did not match her little lamb costume. Okay, worm. Ever hear of Abu Ghraib? Hyde thought it sounded familiar, but was not quite sure. It's where I learned about enhanced interrogation. She laughed maniacally, then held out a hand. Reverend Jimmy was ready with a wet towel. It was almost as if the brother and sister had been through this before. Melba Jean said coldly, Mr. Frisbee, sir, would you please bring me that open case of Dom Perignon and Mr. Plaid? Grab pen and paper, get ready to write down some numbers. Melba Jean issued orders in such a cold, efficient manner that Damien Hyde began to feel uncomfortable. And thus began the waterboarding 
of the great white shark. Water was not good enough for the swindler. Only the best. Soon, Damien Hyde was gagging on his own Dom Perignon at $350 a bottle. Kermit Plaid thought it was bottle number six that did the trick. That is when Damien Hyde began spilling passwords and account numbers. Reverend Jimmy was certain that it took eight bottles of the bubbly, but this was neither here nor there. His sister had worked her magic, and that is what counted. Chapter 26. An Idiot's Guide to Avoid a Kidnapping Charge. On day four, Kermit was able to contact a former cellmate who had served time for money laundering. Two years before the man had confided in Plaid, saying that he had a fortune hidden away in secret offshore accounts, Kermit, a quick study, learned from him the ins and outs of such transactions. Not long afterwards, using Hyde's own computer, the Heavenly Hills bunch had emptied all three of Hyde's accounts and had transferred the money into one of their own. Later, they would divvy up the proceeds, creating separate accounts for Lydia and the seven partners. For the time being, they were faced with the tricky question. What to do with Damien Hyde? Melba Jean, Admiral Nagomo, Harvey Harley Dinkelman, and Orlando Budd all voted death. Vladimir's contribution was... Let's take him to the ocean and see how far the shark can swim. Kermit and Lydia Bunking both abstained. Reverend Jimmy stated the obvious, that if they released Hyde, it would come back on them. All would be for naught. Each would go to jail. It would come to light that they had the money, and tragically, that would be the end of Flying Jesus. In the adjoining room, still tied to the California king, a considerably diminished Damien Hyde yelled at the top of his lungs, Hey, don't I get a vote? The reverend then said, Let's all go to bed, get a good night's sleep, and consider our options in the morning. Day five dawned bright and early. After visits to the hotel breakfast bar and with coffees in hand, they convened another meeting, This time, they closed the door so that Hyde could not overhear. Numerous ideas were tossed around, but no one's position had changed. Finally, Reverend Jimmy stepped forward with a plan. What if we have someone else do it? What? Do do what? Vladimir Frisbee asked. Kill him. Then the blood would not be on our hands, so to speak. I know it's an equivocation, but I'd feel better about it. You mean, we hire somebody? Dinkelman asked. Hell, I'd do it for free. I don't think we need to hire anyone. Let me explain. They divided the money according to how much each had invested. Of course, Bun King got her 5% right off the top, as agreed. And Harley... Not being an actual investor was given 1% for time in trouble. Not an inconsiderable amount. Having invested more money than the others, Jimmy and Melba Jean got the largest share, followed by the Admiral. After that, Vladimir, Wilma, Wilma's Harley's sister, of course, and Kermit Plaid got equal shares. Finally, Orlando Budd was granted $5 million as compensation for the death of his son. Thus, eight new accounts were opened on day five. Reverend Jimmy spelled out his plan for the disposal of Damien Hyde. They would transport Hyde to a remote stretch of the desert, dump him there, then take cover somewhere out of sight, and using a high-powered telescope, watch for what followed. How's that going to get him killed? Vladimir asked. Ah, here's the best part. 
I anonymously call the Cheney Gang's Mr. A and give him Hyde's GPS coordinates. I'm pretty sure they'll know what to do. Chapter 27 In Conclusion At 3 a.m., after dressing Damien Hyde in his shark suit, they loaded him on the bus. They'd gotten him drunk and escorted him out of the Hyatt on Harley's shoulder. No one was the wiser. Orlando carried a box filled with eight bottles of champagne, all that remained of Hyde's Dom Perignon. Kermit Plaid was put in charge of the telescope, which they had purchased the day before. Once they'd deposited the shark in the desert, they parked the Lutheran Beats bus a mile away and began their vigil. Reverend Jimmy disguised his voice and left a message on Mr. A's phone. Affected by alcohol, Damien struggled to stand. Once on his feet, his progress was slow. Three hours later, Reverend Jimmy spotted a black van heading for the spot identified as Hyde's coordinates. Upon seeing the approaching van, Great White Shark waved at what he thought meant rescue. The van stopped 30 feet in front of the shark. A side door slid open, revealing a man in a wheelchair. Holy shit, it's Badger! Reverend Jimmy exclaimed while viewing the action through the scope, and he's got a gun! The gun fired. Jimmy could see the kickback. Badger fired again. It took five seconds before the Heavenly Hills bunch heard the blasts. Looks like Hyde's dead, Reverend Jimmy B. Sunshine said. Yeah, no sh added Vladimir Frisbee while squinting in the direction of the festivities. A shaken Kermit plaid, hoping to restore psychic balance, shifted nervously and groped for less harsh terminology. Uh, can't, can't we just say uh, that he's now metabolically challenged? It just, well, it, it just seems... His voice trailed off, and he did not complete his sentence. Champagne bottles were opened and lifted high. Only Kermit Plaid felt remorse. One day later, 80-year-old Lyman Creed bounced along a desert road in his 1964 Ford. Up ahead, he spotted two buzzards picking at a carcass. He slowed. The buzzards took off. When he got abreast of the bird's meal, he pushed the accelerator to the floor and drove 40 miles nonstop to the nearest police station. I'm telling you, it was a shark. Dead. Out in the desert. <clears throat> no, <laughs> it couldn't have been a shark. The officer responded calmly. We're 500 miles from the ocean. Now, I know a shark when I see a shark, God damn it. it could have been like that Sharknado thing, don't you think? No, sir. I do not. The CIA had agents scouring Croatia looking for Damien Hyde, but the agents were called back when reports reached Langley that a dead shark had been found in the Sonoran Desert southwest of Tucson in Pima County. By the time the news broke, the Heavenly Hills 7 had returned to Flagstaff and settled into their former quiet lives. In July of the following year, Harley Dinkelman and Melba Jean Sunshine were married. Reverend Jimmy B. performed the ceremony. After the wedding, the couple honeymooned in Sturgis, South Dakota. The friends lost track of Orlando Budd, but word has it that he is cohabitating with the lioness that he met at Furcon Phoenix. He and she continue to identify as lions. She is now pregnant with twins, promising to increase their pride to four members. Lydia Bunking returned to Chicago and bought the BMW dealership where she had formerly worked. She immediately fired all of the sales staff who had sexually harassed her. The rest were either women or gay men. Understandably, 
Harley's sister Wilma was proud of her brother for the part he played in retrieving not only her initial $3 million investment, but substantially more as well. And to show her appreciation, she promised not to tell anyone that he continued to wear his moot moose outfit while he lounged around the house. Harley only said that the rental company had offered to sell him the costume at a bargain price and that he could not afford to say no. Reverend Jimmy B. Sunshine bought Hyde's Gulfstream G600 at a government seizure auction. He had flying Jesus painted prominently on each side. Now, he flies regularly between Phoenix and Paris, France, where he's a sugar daddy to a 30-year-old stripper named Randy Amore. He is sublimely happy and is grateful for the Lord's bounty. Kermit Plaid lives in the Chicago suburb of Highwood, where he runs a halfway house for Lutheran skinheads as they transition from incarceration to re-entry. Plaid now considers himself a furry and feels he's a better person. He never misses Fur Con Phoenix. The Admiral took his millions and returned to Nigeria. He retired from the Navy and now funds a large number of orphanages and medical clinics helping to lift the plight of his nation's poor. Oh yes, and he bought a soccer team. Vladimir Frisbee divorced his wife. It was obvious that she, a devoted churchgoer, did not care for him. The feeling was mutual. He gave her a million dollars as a parting gift, which she donated to Reverend Jimmy B. Sunshine's Jet Fuel for Flying Jesus Fund to keep him in the air, and thus allowing him to bless the world's Jews, Muslims, and Hindus on those frequent trips he makes between Phoenix and Paris. Vladimir is now the owner of the Slut Factory. He maintains a hectic schedule scouting Flagstaff for talent and personally supervising auditions. He has contacted the university's Department of Physical Education in regard to the granting of college credit to the many co-eds who dance at his venerable Flagstaff establishment. Mr. Frisbee has also inquired about the possibility of a professorship and is currently waiting for a reply. When not conducting slut factory business, he can be found on his houseboat where he divides his time between beer, fishing, and the 24-year-old honey who had some months earlier presented him with his Arizona lottery check. Yes, big money can and does perform miracles. According to an autopsy, it turned out that Hyde was killed by two blasts from a 12-gauge shotgun. Death was instantaneous. Since his blood alcohol level was three times the legal limit, he probably felt nothing. A special forensic unit sent by the FBI examined his shark costume, but it yielded no clues concerning the whereabouts of the Lutheran Strategic Partners hedge fund's $3.7 billion. However, DNA recovered from the costume matched that of Hyde's former business partner, one D. Bentley Brown. Suspected of the murder of the former Jolly Rogers Pharmaceuticals CEO, Brown is now on the run from authorities. The federal government is still frustrated in its hunt for the cash. However, the fund's investors ultimately received 20 cents on the dollar after Cosmo Cockburn successfully sued the accounting firm of Whitman, Williams, and Webb for negligence for failing to uncover Damien Hyde's fraud. Much later, Hyde's cremated remains were stolen by a disaffected Lutheran who had been swindled by the most hated man in America. The ashes were flushed down a toilet and ultimately were processed by a Pima County sewage treatment facility. The reclaimed water is used to irrigate a county park. The end. 
Visit Neil Ackerman's author profile and Neil Ackerman's book list at www.smashwords.com slash profile slash view slash in L A C K E R M A N. Christopher Marlowe lived with, not with, lived in England at the same time as Shakespeare. And I read a few of his, a couple of his things before, I think on Valentine's Day. So this evening, um, here is something from one of his works called Hero and Leander. This is usually referred to by one line, it lies not in our power to love or hate. By Christopher Marlowe. It lies not in our power to love or hate, for will in us is overruled by fate. When two are stripped, long ere the course begin, we wish that one should lose, the other win, and one especially do we affect of two gold ingots, like in each respect, the reason no man knows, let it suffice, what we behold is censured by our eyes, we're both deliberate, the love is slight. Whoever loved, that loved not at first sight. This poem is called, I Hear America Singing, by Walt Whitman. I hear America singing, the varied carols I hear, those of mechanics, each one singing his as it should be, blithe and strong, the carpenter singing his as he measures his plank or beam, the mason singing his as he makes ready for work or leaves off work. The boatman singing what belongs to him in his boat. The deckhand singing on the steamboat deck. The shoemaker singing as he sits on his bench. The hatter singing as he stands. The woodcutter's song. The plowboy's on his way in the morning or at noon intermission or at sundown. The delicious singing of the mother or of the young wife at work, or of the girl sewing or washing, each singing what belongs to him or her and to none else. The day, what belongs to the day, at night the party of young fellows, robust, friendly, singing with open mouths their strong, melodious songs. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Fireside Tales for Wolfgang. You can view more of my work at Hunter's Acoustic Cabin. Directed by Hunter Ackerman. Produced by GWC Productions. In memory of Wolfgang Beastly. Originally broadcast on GWC Productions' YouTube channel, Caps Media Television Channel 6 in Ventura on KPPQ LP Ventura at 104.1 FM and on the KPPQ Podcast Network. Episodes can also be viewed on Pasadena Media either on Spectrum Charter Channel 32 or on AT&T Uverse Channel 99.